Hello, I'm Ruth Avenga, English specialist and tutor. I'd like to help you today with your Macbeth exam questions. So in your exam, you'll have one question on theme or character, and you need to write an essay based on that. Now in your essay, you're arguing your response to the question, and you must analyze language structure and form to prove that what you're saying is correct. So I would like to use this extract, act one, scene seven, because in your exam you will be given an extract to work from and you should analyse that extract and then refer to other moments within the play as well. So if we go to Act 1, Scene 7, make sure you've read this and that you understand all the literal translations. Let's imagine that our exam question is, how does Shakespeare present Lady Macbeth and Macbeth's relationship? So if we were going to analyse this extract, we need to decide how they appear. What's the dynamics between their relationship in this moment? Act one, scene seven, it's after Macbeth has been to war, he's a hero, he's had the prophecies from the witches that he's going to become Corridor and then become king. Now he's let Lady Macbeth know that. She's excited because Duncan's staying that night in their castle and she wants to have him killed so that Macbeth can become king. Macbeth is already having second thoughts at this moment. He has a very interesting soliloquy just before this, at the beginning of this scene, before he sees Lady Macbeth, where he lists all the reasons that he shouldn't kill Duncan. I'm not going to go through it now, but you have a look. It's all very logical reasons, sensible. It's when he's most coherent, it's most clear, and he lists all the reasons he shouldn't kill Duncan. So he starts this scene by saying, we will not go ahead with this. We're not going to kill Duncan after all. So the end of his soliloquy, around line 25 at this point, we see them together for the first time. So we've seen before now Macbeth is this strong warrior, huge fighter, Suddenly we see him now and he comes across quite differently. So if we're thinking about how their relationship's portrayed in this moment, I think it would be quite hard to argue anything other than Lady Macbeth is absolutely in control at this moment. So they start the scene in opposite positions. Macbeth doesn't want to go ahead with the killing of Duncan to become king. Lady Macbeth wants him to kill Duncan so that he can become king and she can become queen. By the end of this scene, Macbeth agrees. He is going to do what Lady Macbeth wants and he is going to kill Duncan. So how does this strong warrior change from being certain we're not going to do it to by the end agreeing, okay, I will do it? Well, Lady Macbeth influences him and manipulates him and controls him to ensure he does what she wants. So that may well be the way we want to answer the question. How is their relationship presented? Well, at this point, their relationship is presented as she is the one in control. She is the one who influences him. That's okay then, that can be our thrust of our essay, that can be the point that we want to argue, that's how we want to answer the question. But in order to prove we're correct, and in order to get the marks, we need to demonstrate we can analyse the script, the language, the structure and form that's within this script to prove that what we're saying is correct. So I want to show you how we could do that. I believe that we could analyse form. Remember form is demonstrating that you understand it's a play and something very specific to a play, among other things, is stage directions. So if ever we can analyse stage directions, brilliant, and I think here we can. I think the stage directions can provide evidence for us that she is in control. Now, at the end of his soliloquy that opens this scene, he says he has no spur. There's nothing to spur him on to commit the murder except his vaulting ambition. So he recognises that. So he's saying, I've got no will to do this. I've got no need to do this. I have no... I have no desire to do this other than my ambition. And he knows that's wrong, so he doesn't want to do it. Right at that very moment that he's acknowledging he has no spur to do this, enter Lady Macbeth. And it actually breaks up the line. Remember the iambic pentameter should have the 10 beats per line. That's how Shakespeare writes the poetry often. Here, that line becomes interrupted by Lady Macbeth entering. So she actually cuts him off midway. The form here, where we analyse the stage direction, is almost as if Shakespeare is giving a visual cue by letting Lady Macbeth come on stage at that moment that she's the spur, she's the push to get him to do this murder. Interestingly, analysing that stage direction at that point is also structure, because it's interesting that she's structured to enter at that point when he's saying, I have no spur to do it, and she interrupts him. So for me, there's lots of evidence here that this moment is important. The way it's structured and the form of the stage direction make that moment important. It's a significant moment that she enters at that point. And that's great evidence to show that we're saying she's influencing him, she's in control. I think I can find more evidence of form. 
So as we were just talking about the iambic pentameter, an iamb is like the heartbeat rhythm, ba-boom. There's five of those per poetic line, ba-boom, 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 which equates to 10 syllables per poetic line. That's there to indicate to the actor how they should emphasize the words as in their line. So we have not cast aside, so soon was the hope drunk. So we have the iambic pentameter there with the 10 beats, not cast aside, so soon was the hope drunk. But what's interesting is it's split between the two characters. Macbeth starts that iambic pentameter line and Lady Macbeth finishes it. Always interesting, if you see a split iambic pentameter line, try and comment on it, if you can make it relevant to what your question is. And I think we can here, because what I think that shows, and this is repeated throughout this scene, if you look, she, she often cuts him off and they share the iambic pentameter. What that tells the actress playing this part is that she must come straight in. Not cast aside, so soon was the hope drunk. She comes in without missing a beat because she must stay true to the iambic pentameter line. So it makes it sound as though she's almost cutting him off. She's stopping him in his thought. Okay, so how can we link that to our point that she's in control? Well, I, I would say the use of this shared line, Shakespeare shows that she doesn't allow Macbeth to continue his line of thought, to continue his argument which he's arguing to say, we shouldn't kill Duncan, it's wrong. She keeps stopping him. She keeps cutting him off so that she can influence him, so she can manipulate him, so her ideas can overpower his. I would use that evidence. Okay, so good. We've got a bit of form. We've got a little bit of structure. I think there's more structure that we can have here. Structure also includes punctuation. Look at the punctuation in Lady Macbeth's speech here, line 33 onwards. One, two, three, four, five question marks she has in that speech. Five question marks. And there are no pauses in her speech. What that shows is these are all rhetorical questions she doesn't want him to answer. She's using those questions to make him think, but not giving him space to answer. So she's ranting. She's pouring out her thoughts, her ideas onto him without giving him space to respond. So her argument becomes the dominant argument. Again, great evidence that she's in control, she's manipulating, she's influencing him. And one way she does it, one way we can analyse part of that evidence can be this use of the excessive, the repetition of the rhetorical question without giving him space to think. Great, so we've analysed some structure, we've analysed some form, that's all evidence to prove that what we're arguing for is correct. Now we can analyse language. Let's look at some of the things she's saying then, what she's saying to try and influence him, or what she's saying that gives her the control. Well, there's a semantic field here of cowardice, of fear. Semantic field is when you have words that are connected to the same idea. So a semantic field of war might be words like army, soldier, bullet. They're all words that are connected to the same idea. And she's doing this here with words like a feared. She's, she's saying, you're afraid. Valor, she questions his valor. Valor means courage. She's like, you don't have the courage to do this. She uses words, she calls him a coward. She insults him. And she says that you dare not. I would, you want the crown, but you dare not do what you need to do to get it. So durst means dare. You dare not do what needs to be done. So you can zoom in on all of these words, put them all together, talk about how it's a semantic field that continues to make him feel he's not brave enough. She's suggesting all the time there, you're not brave enough to do this. You're too much of a coward. You don't have the strength. Now, that's interesting because he's a warrior. He's known, he's a hero for his violence, for his strength. So she's really hitting him where it hurts by suggesting that actually you're too much of a coward. Of course, she does all that with the questions, so she doesn't give him a chance to answer. She just makes him think, oh, am I a coward? Am I being, have I lost my strength? Alongside that, the other thing she does is she questions his manhood. She says here, when you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more than man. Macbeth stops her and he tries to defend himself and he says, no, no, I dare do all that a man should do. And if I were to do more, I would actually no longer be a man. He suggests the insinuation is he'd be more like a beast. If he were to step over the line and actually kill Duncan, he would no longer be a man. He would be a beast. 
And she says, no, no, no. When you told me earlier you would do it, when you dare do it, then you were a real man. Now you dare not do it, you're not a man at all. And to kill him, you would be more of a man in my eyes. I mean, he's quite cruel because she's now emotionally manipulating him by suggesting, I'll love you more if you do it because I'll see you more as a man and I find that attractive. So she's, she's using this idea that to be a man is to be strong, to be aggressive, to take everything you want. That's how she's presenting what it is to be a man. She does this earlier. So she starts off by questioning and saying, how come you've changed your mind? First you agreed to do it, now you're saying you won't do it. And she's using the metaphor of being drunk. She's saying when you were drunk, you were brave and now you've woken up the next morning, it says green and pale. Now you're hung over, now you dare not do it. And then she says, from this time, such I account thy love. So she's, she's using emotive language there to make him feel guilty because she's saying, you're so fickle, you've changed your mind. One minute you do it, the next minute you won't. And, and now I'm going to assume that's how you are with my love. I can't trust you because one day you'll love me, the next day you won't. So she's really playing on his emotions to make him feel guilty, to get him to do what she wants. So not only is she using this semantic field, suggesting that he's too afraid, questioning his manhood, making him feel weak, She's also questioning his love and saying, if you loved me, you would do this. And if you do this, I'll love you even more. So she's really manipulating him. And it works, because <laughs> by the end of this, he says, okay, I'm settled, I will do this. So hopefully you could see, if we had a question, how's their relationship presented in this extract? It'd be difficult to argue anything other than she is in control, she manipulates, she influences him, she gets what she wants. Okay, that's our point. We must provide evidence. Hopefully you can see how we can use the stage directions as evidence. We can use the iambic pentameter, the split line as evidence. We can use the punctuation as evidence. And we can use the language as evidence to show how she is manipulating him. Do bear in mind, in your actual exam, you would need to examine this moment and other moments. Now don't go away believing that Lady Macbeth's always in control. No, no, no. This changes throughout the play. They go on a journey. At the beginning, she's absolutely dominant. Now, as that goes on, that changes very much. As the play goes on, Macbeth takes over. He starts to shut her out. He starts not telling her the truth. He doesn't tell her when he decides to kill Banquo. And by the end, she becomes more and more invisible and more and more insignificant in his life. Until the end, she ends up taking her own life off stage. She's really not part of his life at all. So this changes very much. At the beginning, she's very much in control. But in your actual essay, you would give examples of other moments when she loses that control. But when you're given an extract, make sure you're analysing language, structure and form to prove that what you say is correct. I hope that was helpful. Any other questions, do get in touch.